Hello, and thank you for joining us for the presentation, Tick-Borne Testing Solutions Overview 2020. Our speaker today is Dr. Philip Malloy. Dr. Malloy was born in Boston and is currently living in Plymouth, Massachusetts. He received his undergraduate degree from Bowdoin College, his MD from Tufts, and completed his residency at the University of Minnesota. He is currently serving as the Medical Director of Tick-Borne Diseases at Sonic Northeast. Dr. Malloy has a longstanding clinical and research interest in Lyme and other tick-borne diseases ever since his fellowship under Dr. Alan Steer, the discoverer of Lyme disease. He has participated in numerous research protocols on Lyme disease and associated tick-borne infections, including the treatment of Lyme arthritis, the development of laboratory tests to distinguish Lyme disease from the Lyme vaccine serological response, blood tests for screening blood donors for Babesia, and in characterizing and diagnosing B. miamodii. His general rheumatology research interests have also included treatments and monitoring disease activity in rheumatoid arthritis and clinical trials for therapeutic interventions for osteoporosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and osteoarthritis. And with that, I'd like to present Dr. Phil Malloy. Thank you, Tiffany. And uh, again, welcome everyone who's in the audience today. And I hope that by the time we're done, you will have a clear understanding of how we as laboratory people can help our clinicians um, order the right tests, diagnose and identify tick various tick-borne diseases. So <clears throat> let's get started. Here's our agenda. We're going to talk about the common tick-borne diseases there are numerous agents transmitted to humans by ticks. We're gonna talk about the most prevalent ones, not all of them. Then I'm going to make some general comments, create for you a paradigm high level of how we diagnose infectious diseases. Number three, we're gonna focus on what's out there now for Lyme disease testing. And finally, other tick-borne disease um, infectious agents that are out there, including the topic of co-infection. In other words, a single tick bite can transmit more than one of these agents to a given patient. So let's, let's just get going here. Uh, you've heard a little bit about my biography. This is there for anyone who wants to look at the references or learn more. These are various uh, stages of the life cycle of the tick. So on the far right of my screen is the nymphal phase. And as you go left, um, I mean, sorry, the larval stage followed by the nymphal stage. And then there are female and male adults and they can be engorged or not engorged. I sometimes tell my patients that if you take a ballpoint pen and just make a dot on a white piece of paper, that's how big a tick is in the spring, April and May, when it's a larval stage. The nymphal stage is also about one millimeter. So these are tiny ticks. These are not dog ticks, wood ticks, or the common ticks that you find on their pets, typically. The other ticks are not capable of transmitting Lyme disease. Only the deer tick, it's called Ixides, is the only known uh, vector that transmits this uh, infection to humans. That's true for the other agents we're going to talk about as well, Babesia, Anaplasma, Ehrlichia, and Neomotoi. They're transmitted to humans by Ixides, the deer tick, and you're looking at the various phases. I think the point is that um, early in the season, they are tiny, and it's very easy not to see them. In fact, most people who contract Lyme disease do not recall a tick bite. Let's talk about terminology for a minute. In the left column is the name of the organism, Babesia microti. The disease is called Babesiosis, and the abbreviation is simple as Babesiosis. There are other species of Babesia other than B. microti, but B. microti is responsible for 99% of the Babesia that's transmitted to humans. The other species, Duncani, used to be called WA1 in the Northwest, and divergence is found in Europe, um, are very, very minor in North America. Next organism, Anaplasma phagocytophilum. 
The abbreviation is HGA, and the disease that that stands for is human granulocytic anaplasmosis. Just so you know these terms that will be on subsequent slides. HGA, human granulocytic anaplasmosis. Ehrlichia chaffeensis. The disease it causes, that that germ causes, is human monocytic ehrlichiosis, or HME. You take a pause here for the first three agents we just talked about. You will see, and I will emphasize this on the next slide coming up, that these organisms, these top three, live in blood cells, don't they? There's a big implication on how to, on what blood test to order and how we find it and how we diagnose it. Babesia lives in red cells, of course. HGA lives in granulocytes, obviously. And HME lives in monocytes. Those are blood cells. The bottom two are Borrelia burgdorferi, which um, causes a disease known as Lyme disease. And Borrelia miyamotoi, which is, of course, in the same family as Borrelia burgdorferi. And it causes a slightly different phenotype of a disease. It is called tick-borne relapsing fever, and there's its abbreviation. Those two are distinguished by the fact that they don't live in blood cells, typically. So we don't look for it in blood cells. So you see on this slide the agents we just talked about, and they're divided. The question here is which one doesn't fit in with the others. Of course, there's more than one right answer. Four of these agents are transmitted to humans by the deer tick. And HME, Herlichia chaffeensis, remember, is transmitted by a different tick called the Lone Star Tick. So if you lived in a state or a region of the United States where the Lone Star Tick was not found, then you're not going to find that disease there. So the geography of these diseases depends on the spread of the ticks. And of course, that's not a static thing. With climate change and travel, the area that you can find these ticks in is expanding as well. There's another way that these organisms are different. Babesia is not a bacteria. Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi, anaplasma, and Ehrlichia are bacteria, and Babesia is a distant cousin of malaria. It is an intra-erythrocytic parasite, so it's not a bacteria. So there's another way that these organisms are different one from the other. Finally, as I mentioned before, the three here that you see, two bacteria and one parasite that have an asterisk on the left, live in your blood cell, either red cells or monocytes or granulocytes, the implication here is that you can find them. You can even see them with the naked eye sometimes in the blood. Borrelia burgdorferi is not typically a blood-borne organism. The word that we use is it's, Lyme is not trophic. It doesn't tend to settle in blood cells. It briefly is there uh, for a day or two early in the infection or three or four, but very, very, uh, you will see that in a minute, very, very briefly is in the bloodstream. The other agents on this page with the asterisk live in the blood cells. You can see them, you can find them in whole blood PCR testing. So Lyme doesn't live in blood. People ask, ask me all the time, how come you just can't um, diagnose Lyme like you can the other agents? Look in the blood. Well, it doesn't like to live in the blood. It likes joints causes Lyme arthritis, likes skin, causes various rashes, and occasionally neurologic and cardiac tissue. Those are the manifestations. That's where it likes to live in your body, not in blood cells. So you can see, <clears throat> let's look at the bottom two maps of the U.S. first, because those diseases are carried by the Lone Star Tick. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever has several tick vectors, but it's not the deer tick. So if you lived... Take a look at Oregon between, um, I don't know if you can see my pointer, between Washington State and Northern California. There were really no um, Lone Star ticks in that state, so you would not expect to
to find diseases transmitted by the lone star tick there. On the other hand, the lone star tick has migrated, as you will see in a minute, up the coast. It used to travel on the east coast as far north as Maryland, Delaware, never further north. About 10 years ago, it was found in coastal New Jersey, a few years later on Long Island, a few years later in coastal Connecticut, then Rhode Island, then Massachusetts. So these um, maps are dynamic, they're not fixed. The three maps on the top are showing you the distribution of human cases of Lyme disease, babesiosis, and anaplasmosis, all transmitted by the same tick, the deer tick, Ixodes. This was um, not the map of the Lone Star tick 10 years ago. As you see now, Long Island, you probably can't see my pointer. I'm trying to, on my screen, I'm pointing at Long Island, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Cape Cod, and Massachusetts, and even up to Maine. And the Lone Star tick has expanded. That's a recent phenomenon. 10 years ago, we never saw HME in New England because the vector was not here. The tick that transmits it to human was not found in New England until about 10 years ago. Now we are seeing it, not quite as commonly as Lyme disease, Babesia, and Anaplasma, but it's clearly it is the tick is here. When we search these ticks and drag for them out in nature, they carry Rocky Mountain spider fever, they carry HME, and they transmit it to humans. This slide reminds me to remind you and clinicians that tick-borne diseases are seasonal. Everyone knows this. I know you're saying to yourself, duh, that's obvious. Everyone knows tick-borne diseases are seasonal. It has to do with the life cycle of these agents and the ticks. Also with the fact that we are wearing shorts and we are outside in the summer and not in the winters in the Northeast. The reason I'm mentioning that to you is that your family members or colleagues or you're going to hear stories of a patient or a friend or a relative who went to the emergency room in the summer in the upper Midwest or in a Lyme endemic area, the Northeast, and they won't have a rash and the ER doc or the urgent care doc will say, you have the summer flu. The summer flu does not occur, the flu, influenza does not occur in June and July. Anyone who goes into the emergency room with a flu-like illness in the summer months, it's a tick-borne disease until proven otherwise. Almost 100% of the time when doctors say you have the summer flu in these endemic areas, they're wrong. Shouldn't say it even. So let's give you a high level of how we diagnose infectious diseases. And I'm gonna show you some graphs that illustrate this as well. There are two ways that doctors, researchers, and laboratories help clinicians diagnose infectious diseases throughout history and in all infections, TB, pneumonia, Zika virus, hepatitis, they're all, uh, they all follow these rules. You can either diagnose infections directly, show me the organism. We've done that historically by doing blood cultures, sputum cultures, urine cultures, special stains of spinal fluid, you know the routine. More recently in the past decade, PCR, I, t I know this is not true, but it, it's catchy and I tell doctors, think of PCR as a molecular culture. It's really not a culture, but it performs like a molecular culture. Some organisms are difficult or impossible to culture. Syphilis is a good example. And we do serologies. Another example of an indirect way to diagnose infections are parvovirus serologies, hepatitis serologies, although we can do PCRs as well. A skin test for TB is an indirect way of showing a patient's immune response to TB. So we're not looking for the organism. So remember that this is gonna be very important. When you're looking for an infectious disease, you either show me the organism or show me the patient's immune response. 
frequently by serologies. Now, Lyme disease is unique because it's hard to show the organism. In Lyme disease, there's only a very, very scant number of organisms. In joint fluids, we can see massive joint swelling, effusions full of white cells, tremendously inflamed joint fluids or skin rashes. And we will have to look at hundreds of sections to find even one organism. So those of you who have spent any time in micro know that this is not like doing a gram stain of pus where organisms are in sheets and sheets and by the millions in front of your eyes. Lyme disease is hard to find the organism, so we rely on serologies typically because demonstrating the organism is not impossible, but it's more challenging. So early in infection, it's, it's very frequent, common, to see a patient with a tick-borne disease that's infected and has no antibodies. The medical term for having no antibodies is seronegative. Does that mean serology is a lousy tool? No, it means uh, it takes two or three weeks for your body to make antibodies. Therefore, in the first two or three weeks of a symptomatic illness with a tick-borne disease or Zika virus or HIV, you can find the organism acutely before a patient has antibodies. That is critical and it's important. If a doctor says to you, which test should I order? I suspect my patient has Babesia or Lyme or anaplasma. What test do I order? You don't know enough to answer that question right now. You have to say, is your patient presenting with an acute or chronic presentation? The more acute it is, the more you must look for the organism by PCR. And the more chronic it is, the more you're likely you are to have positive serologies, antibodies. That is demonstrated in this graph. This is not data, this is an illustration only. The graph on the left, that's mustard colored or whatever that color is, orangey, is the duration typically of a pathogen, could be Zika virus, it could be a tick-borne disease, it could be Rocky Mountain spotted fever, it could be HIV. I am sick, I have bacteremia or viremia, and eventually as my body is attempting to get over the infection, I develop antibodies. So as time passes, antibodies are extraordinarily useful, and in the first days or weeks of infection, PCR is extraordinarily useful if you look at the right specimen. So in this, whoop, I clicked the wrong one there. Here we go. The period of time where a patient is sick, has a positive blood culture, PCR is positive in the blood prior to developing antibodies is referred to as the window period. I'm symptomatic, I'm infected, I'm sick, I am a patient with a disease, and I have yet to develop antibodies. So if I order antibodies during the window period, I will be ordering the wrong test, and I will get a negative result. I will miss my opportunity to diagnose it. In some, <clears throat> some diseases, there is an overlap. So patients can be, can they be PCR and antibody positive? Yes, of course. Now, some agents don't like to live in your bloodstream. I already told you that Lyme disease does not like to live in your bloodstream. So the window of bacteremia is really narrow. Zika is like that as well. So I only have a short window of opportunity, a short period of time to diagnose Lyme disease by looking for it in the blood. And by the way, it is culturable during this period of time. Why don't we culture it? It's clearly possible to culture it because like TB, it takes weeks. The incubation in the lab is three or four weeks, making it not useful to a clinician in an urgent care center. Also large volumes of blood are required and weeks because there's very, very few organisms there. PCR is, is a, a gift in the early days, in the early days of Lyme infection. There's an overlap here as well. Now here, contrast the Lyme example on the previous slide. 
to an example like this, babesiosis, where I am bacteremic. Of course, you're not bacteremic with babesia, are you? You're parasitemic. It's a parasite, really, technically not a bacteria. And babesia lives for months and various levels in my red blood cells. And by the way, unlike Lyme, the number of copies of organisms per ml in Babesia is massive. 100,000 is common, 500,000, a million copies per ml is frequent in Babesia, more. It's easy to find in red blood cells, which is why you can see it with the naked eye in a smear. Babesia lasts treated or untreated to various degrees of parasitemia for months in your blood. That's why there's such a long overlap between PCR positivity and serology. That's when symptoms begin a day or two after you become infected. That's the window period. This is an important concept, isn't it? Could there be a window when both the PCR and the antibodies are both negative? So this is a theoretic question I'm asking you. What if the time the evolution and unfolding of an infection was that demonstrated on this time frame here. What if you were unlucky enough to draw a blood on a patient in that window and you just were too late and you missed the PCR bacteremia phase and you were a day or two too early to catch the immune response? Is that conceivable? Well, we know it is conceivable for many infections, been well worked out for Zika virus, for example. There is a window here. It's about a week long. We know that for some infections between clearing the organism and developing the antibody. So if you were a doctor, how would you address that? What would you do? I would send a follow-up specimen a week later. If I really suspected, I wouldn't do this in the worried well, the people who are, read something on the internet and are wondering if they have this, that, or the other thing to explain why their energy has been low for the past 10 years. And there are people who are looking for tick-borne disease diagnoses to explain chronic nonspecific symptoms. But if I have a patient who's really sick, has a fever, a flu-like illness in the summer, I really think something's going on, if the PCR and the antibodies are negative, I repeat them in one or two weeks. And now you know why. I've mentioned this already. <clears throat> you can culture Lyme from whole blood. It's not useful uh, clinically because it takes so long and it grows so slow. PCR detects the organisms. I think everyone knows what PCR is. It detects specific DNA sequences, probes and primers are chosen based on gene sequence knowledge so that we're not picking D DNA sequences that it would share with other organisms. Rapid turnaround time, meaning same day. The delay in PCR really is how long it takes the specimen to show up in the lab. Every specimen that shows up in our lab by 9 or 10 in the morning is reported um, the same day before we go home at night. It's very useful in synovial fluid. It's useful in blood only in a brief period of time. It's very useful in the skin. People with Lyme skin rashes have it in their skin, although it's not necessary to do skin biopsies or skin aspirates. If you did, you would find it there. And it's variably easy to find in, in uh, cerebrospinal fluid. You have to do a spinal tap to get that, though. The limitation. I don't want to have a spinal tap today. What about serologies for Lyme? There are many ELISA tests, IFAs, different variations of enzyme-based tests on the market. In fact, there are 60 licensed approved tests on the market for Lyme serologies. IgM and IgG, as you know, are available to test separately. Some labs will uh, do a screening test and just give you an index that combines IgG and IgM. Some labs will separate them. And there is a methodology called antibody capture EIA, which is different from an indirect ELISA. It's too complicated to go into. That's ideally and uniquely suited for testing paired serum and CSF. 
The reason for that is it automatically corrects for differences in total protein and immunoglobulin concentrations in those two body compartments. I think you know a little bit about what a Western blot is. You take a strain of Bieberdorferi, you put it on a strip of paper, I'll show you a picture, and you incubate the patient's serum on top of that. Western blotting performs very poorly. Both IgG and IgM Western blotting performs very poorly in early Lyme disease, the first couple of weeks of infection. IgM Western blot is one of the poorer tests in all of medicine. The CDC and IDSA, Infectious Disease Society of America, insists, of course doctors don't, aren't aware of this and don't do it, that we should never do an IgM Western blot in a patient who has symptoms over 30 days. Why not? Because by 30 days you have an IgG response, and IgG is a great Western blot test, and IgM Western blot is a terrible test. Misleading. Lyme disease is traditionally tested by a two-tier or two-step serologic profile process. It goes back to 1994, and you should know these abbreviations. This is not just coming down the pike, it is here today. The traditional way to diagnose Lyme has been called the standard two-tier test. Everyone who has done this is familiar already. We do a screening test. If that is negative, testing is done. If that test is equivocal or positive, a second tier is done that is more specific to make sure you're not picking up false positives. And according to the standard two-tier test recommendations, the second tier is a Western blot. Because of many problems with Western blotting, I'm gonna go over some of them, but not all of them with you. Um, the CDC has been looking for six, seven, eight years to come up with more useful, less confusing guidelines for clinicians. And last year, one year ago, in August of 2019, came out with a very important proclamation authorizing and recommending modified two-tier testing, which do not include Western blot. Many of you are hearing this for the first time today and are saying, what? Lyme disease testing with no Western blot? Yes. So here is a summary of what I just told you. Standard two-tier testing, the abbreviation STTT, 26 years ago, it was on the market, has been supplemented in many situations replaced by modified two-tier testing. I can tell you that um, at my lab, a sonic lab, east side in the northeast, Quest, LabCorp, all have MTTT up, running, promoting, offered today. Our salespeople are knocking on doors, telling our doctors that they should be doing MTTT, not STTT. Right now, today, no Western blot. Again, I would like to remind you that IgM Western blot never recommended for symptoms over 30 days. Why do we do it then? Why do you do it? Why do we do it? It's because we don't capture clinical information on test requisitions. And this is a schematic of the STTT from the CDC's website, showing that you do a screening test that's sensitive, but maybe less specific. If that is positive or equivocal, you do an IgGNM or an IgG only if the symptoms are 30 days. And um, I told you this already at the bottom of the page. If you suspect Lyme disease in a patient who is symptomatic and the test is negative, do another one. You don't have to wait a long time. Here's the MTTD, no Western blot. It's being actively promoted. It's out there on the streets right now. So this is what East Side and Sunrise, we belong to the uh, larger family of Sonic Labs, an international lab company. I am in the Northeast region, um, which is you know Virginia, Pennsylvania, North, New York, New Jersey, all of New England. We currently offer our customers the STTT. We use your platform, which, and as you know, I hope you know that the first, um, <clears throat> you offer a combined IgG and IgM. The IgG antigen is a recombinant VLSE. It's a recombinant peptide. And the IgM is tested with um, a fusion to a dual recombinant, OSPC 
protein and the VLSE peptide. I'm not sure what the fact of GINSART says, but I do know that um, labs like ours that use this, um, in fact, I know lab directors in our family that if the first one is uh, positive, they just report positive or negative. And other labs, other lab managers in our system either will report an index value. So uh, we have the option of reporting an index value. So you know high, high, if it's really a high number or if it's just barely at the cutoff, or you can just say positive. The reason to report the uh, index value is based on the assumption, unproven assumption, that the higher the number is, that a 10 versus a one, that the 10 is less likely to be a false positive or cross-reactive. That hasn't been proven, but that's an assumption. And that's a rationale for reporting a number. So the claim test performance, and I got this on your website, by the way, um, and I don't know any laboratory person or doctor, that's why I put the red thing there, the comment there, that believes that the specificity of IgM is 100%. Because all of us in, in the trenches in real life um, have count, and I see patients, by the way, in Plymouth, Massachusetts. I've had clinics on Cape Cod, Wareham. I have a clinic now on Nantucket, Lyme, very Lyme endemic areas. I've seen false positive IgMs commonly. So I, um, I know your, your claim in the package insert is based on a small number of uh, I think it's 20 or 30 specimens, but um, I can tell you that clinicians and lab managers that use your platform don't believe that it's really 100% specific. That means there are no false positives. Um, currently, uh, we offer, and when we use the Diasorin Tier 1, um, we use um, a Western blot. We use the gold standard Western blot. You know, Quest uses something different, Mayo uses something different, the Mass Channel uses something different, all that. So this is a, what a Western blot looks like. And these are the CDC guidelines. I just want to show you that, not spend time on it. Tell my patients it looks like a barcode. Those lines are very specific. I'm not going to get into what those lines, lines mean right now. So that's Lyme disease. And now we're going to, we're halfway done. We're going to talk about some of the other tick-borne diseases, the common ones. So I'm going to start by saying, what do these three patients have in common? This is, these are all real patients that I've been involved with their care personally. Um, the first one's a 10-year-old girl presents to a pediatrician with a classic EM rash. It could be in any textbook, perfect EM rash. Everyone knows erythema migrans is the name of the rash that is caused by Lyme disease and virtually nothing else looks like it in all of medicine. The second is a 55-year-old presents to his primary care doctor with fatigue, hemolytic anemia, a large spleen, but a negative blood smear for Babesia or related parasites. The doctor was thinking Babesia sent the smear. The third is another patient of mine, a 39-year-old male, feel great, pulled into my hospital's parking lot when he saw the Red Cross was having an urgent blood drive. What do those three patients all have in common? You should be asking yourself that. And of course, the answer is they all have Babesia. They all are culture positive, PCR positive Babesia patients. So before um, we go much further, you're going to say, wait a minute, does Babesia cause a Lyme rash? I thought you just said that was just Lyme. Well, that, of course, is a patient who has both infections. This patient has Lyme and Babesia. What about the next patient whose smear was negative? PCR is um, about 10,000 times more sensitive at low levels of parasitemia than smears. And can you be totally asymptomatic and have Babesia? Yes, you can. Let's step back and ask you, who is Nancy Gray? Nancy Gray, ACK is the abbreviation for Nantucket, which is the zip code on this planet that has the most Babesia and the most Lyme disease in the world. She was a summer resident in 1969, over 50 years ago. She returned from the, her summer on Nantucket 
and went to her local emergency room in New Jersey with an acute febrile illness, a flu-like illness, a hemolytic anemia, and abdominal pain. Lab tech noticed on her manual CBC that there was something funny in the red cells. Didn't know what it was, didn't look like malaria exactly, and the patient hadn't traveled outside the US, sent the blood to the CDC. This was the first human case of Babesia microti. Number one case known. So this, the index case, 1969. These two researchers, colleagues of mine now deceased in the 70s, heard about her, went to Nantucket. They were the first doctors who solved important pieces of this, which is very related to Lyme disease and Babesia, that the white-footed mouse was a reservoir, and that the tick, the deer tick, which was previously unknown before 1969, is the, is the vector that transmitted this to humans. It was first named after this pathologist from one of the teaching hospitals in Boston, but later was renamed Ixides scapularis. That's the name of the tick. It's what we call the deer tick. While cases were accumulating on Nantucket, it got the nickname Nantucket fever. That was the first name of babesiosis. The clinical spectrum varies. You can have, yes, you can have babesia and have no symptoms. Yes, you can be critically ill, especially if you are immunocompromised. Hemolytic anemia with the usual blood findings shown there. It, it's, there are many fatalities in neonates and immunosuppressed persons. For reasons that I'm not going to go into, your spleen is an important organ in host defense against many tick-borne diseases. Patients who have a splenectomy, even from traumatic, a car accident or a sports accident, uh, succumb to Babesia frequently. Other immunosuppressed, very elderly, and people shown on that slide. Similar geographic distribution and seasonality as Lyme, same tip vector. And because you can be asymptomatic and because you can have prolonged parasitemia, it, uh, you, can be, you can feel perfectly well donate blood and introduce this to the blood supply. The name for that is called TTB transfusion, transmitted babesiosis. It's the most common infection and the most common fatality associated with blood transfusions in the United States. Interesting. How do you diagnose babesia? Show me the organism or show me the immune response. Acutely infected patients are PCR positive and antibody negative. I'm going to be saying that over and over again for these other agents. There are many ways to do serologies. I'm not going to go into the differences. This is what it looks like on a smear. You must have about 200,000 or 250,000 organisms per ml to see it with the naked eye. What about anaplasma? Anaplasmosis. It was first identified by a friend of mine, Dr. Johan Bakken. I worked with him in Minnesota before. In 1990, the first case was four years on the East Coast, was four years later by a doctor who's still practicing with me on Nantucket, Dr. Tim Lepre, 1994. Obviously, it lives in granulocytes and it's doxycycline responsive, unlike Babesia. The clinical spectrum varies. Similar to Babesia, it's potentially fatal in immunosuppressed persons. This is an acute illness with no known chronic phase. Is that important? Yes. If I have chronic arthritis, chronic fatigue, chronic headaches, I don't have to put HGA on the differential diagnosis. There's no known chronic anything with HGA. An acute disease. How do you diagnose it? Show me the organism or show me the immune response. Acutely infected patients are PCR positive and antibody negative. Many ways to do serologies. They all perform equally well. Um, this is looking a little bit dark on my screen. I hope you can see it better. I'm showing an inclusion in the granulocyte. That's a very obvious one. They're hard to find and they occur less frequently 
than Babesia. Babesia is easy to see in red cells. HGA is a challenge to see, but is definitely seeable. And all summer long in our lab, um, we um, see probably one a week of unsuspected anaplasmosis that's picked up on a smear in the summer months in coastal New England. What about HME, different tick, first identified in Fort Chaffee, that's why it's called Chaffeeensis, 1991. So these diseases don't go back to antiquity, they're relatively recent. They're in monocytes, it's doxycycline responsive. It used to be only in the middle Atlantic states and in the southeast until the Lone Star Tick started spreading up the coast, which I told you already. Similar to the other agents we've talked about, the clinical spectrum varies. You can be really sick or not that sick. Again, fatal in immunosuppressed persons. Again, it's an acute disease with no known chronic state. You either get over it or it kills you. If you're a vulnerable, susceptible, frail person, you could uh, succumb to it. Otherwise, you get over it with no long-term sequelae. It's not chronic. You hear... Uh, stuff on the internet about chronic Lyme and chronic anything, but not HME, not HGA, not Miyamoto. Those are not chronic diseases. How do you diagnose HME? Show me the organism or show me the immune response. Yes, you can see it by smear. PCR is way more sensitive. There are multiple ways to do serologies. Borrelia miyamotoi, there are a lot of Borrelia in this world. Um, there are relapsing fevers, not in New England, but for those of you who are on the West Coast and the Southwest, um, there are uh, tick-borne and other vector transmitted relapsing fevers. Um, but Borrelia miyamotoi is transmitted by the exact same deer tick that transmits Lyme and Babesia and anaplasma. So Dr. Miyamoto, first identified Borrelia miyamotoi in ticks in 1995. He sequenced it. He wrote in his first description, I don't know if this is ever gonna be important. I don't know if this infects uh, domestic animals or humans or whatever, but here's a new germ. He cataloged it away. Until 2011, not that long ago, when the first case in Russia was reported, and the year after New York and New Jersey patients were identified in our lab, and I was on the team that reported many of these cases in both the New England Journal of Metal and the Medicine and the Annals of Internal Medicine. It's been a lot, but um, we published in 2015 51 consecutive PCR positive cases of Miyamoto and described what they were like. Um, you can't tell these diseases apart. The second publication on Miyamoto is titled uh, Brillium Miyamotoi Mimicking Anaplasmosis. It looks the same way. How many ways do we have to get sick after all? You know, fever, headache, chills. Um, sometimes your white count is a little bit low, platelets low. Um, you, no doctor, no matter how skilled you are, can tell a person who's infected with anaplasma and say, this is anaplasma, it's not Miyamotoi. You must rely on the lab to help you sort this out. It's where you come in. It's transmitted by the deer tick. Um, and it's diagnosed the way you know it. So here, we're gonna finish up with a few um, additional things here. This is a, a Lyme rash called erythema migraines. My question to you, you don't have to answer because this talk is not interactive, but would you order a blood test if this patient, if you were the doctor and this patient was sitting in front of you in the exam room, would you order a rash, I mean, a, a blood test? So the CDC and the IDSA says, if you see a patient in the right geography and has a rash like this, it's Lyme, whether the blood test is positive, negative, this patient has Lyme, you have to treat him. So do you order a lab test? So I'll show you a cartoon, doctor saying offhand, my first opinion is that you probably have an arrow through your head, but just to be sure, I'm gonna order some tests. Of course, the, the person had an, an arrow through his head. Of course, the previous person has Lyme disease. Should you order a test? It's a question mark. And the answer is probably you should. 
Why? Because this patient, you don't know that the patient has Babesia plus Lyme, or you don't know what else they have. Presenting symptoms are often nonspecific. We talked about that. Next bullet, even with a rash, like the one you saw in that picture, you haven't ruled out that the patient doesn't have anaplasma or Babesia, and co-infections are very common. Here are some data on co-infections, and you know, you tell me if these numbers are important enough for you. In the top set of data, you will see that if I have Lyme disease, I have a six or seven percent chance of being PCR positive for, for Babesia, and a two and a half percent chance of being PCR positive for anaplasma. What if you just look the other way? Look at all your Babesia cases, and I know this number is stunningly high, 47.5 percent. Well, half of those actually had Lyme from a previous summer. They were just serol serology positive, but you know, 20 or 20 something percent were co-infected, PCR positive for both agents. To me, those numbers are big enough to tell me I should be looking for co-infections. I should be looking for co-infections. Mayo Clinic has data to show the same thing. Babesia patients, 24% were co-infected with Lyme. That's why many labs you should know this. Our labs, people who are on the front line, offer our customers acute panels, which are intended for the summer months for patients who have suspect acute tick-borne illnesses. So these are, this is the lingo that we use. We call our tick panel, the name that you're seeing on this slide, stands for tick-borne disease. TIB, TBD is tick-borne disease, tick-borne disease acute panels. It's very PCR driven, but it always includes a Lyme serology because it's so easy to miss Lyme disease in the blood. So on this slide, you see more about what an acute panel should be. PCR for most of the agents. You can never skip ordering antibodies for Lyme because it's not in the bloodstream for very long at all. The most common mistakes I see Wrapping up, ordering the wrong test. Um, I think a patient has Babesia, I order the whole panel. I think a patient has Lyme arthritis or some neurologic Lyme manifestation or something chronic, and I order an acute tick panel. I only order an acute tick panel if a patient is acutely sick. Otherwise, I'm wasting tests. I think it's a mistake or a pitfall doing Western blots, IgM Western blots at all. And it's been over 20 years since I have ordered an IgM Western blot. I don't mind saying that in public. Well, it only takes two bands, according to the CDC, two bands, and it's positive. All of us see patients all the time who have one or two bands by IgM Western blot. They don't have Lyme disease. They never had Lyme disease. And it's a false positive and a misleading test. So I think doing an IgM Western blot at all Thankfully, it's going away as people shift away from the standard two-tier test, STTT, to the MTTT, who has no Western blot. This is a big problem, doing follow-up serologies. It's been known, not to bore you with too much clinical data, but if I get Lyme disease, there's a delay in treatment, I have a lot of antibodies. Those antibodies, after I get better, those antibodies persist for years or decades. Yet there are doctors that routinely do follow-up serologies, call a patient, says your Lyme test is still positive, here's another month of doxycycline or whatever they say. It's uh, nonsense to practice like that because it would be like um, you, me um, checking my um, rubella titer now, and if it's positive, you concluding that I'm actively infected and I need to be treated for it. Antibodies frequently are reflecting remote exposure, not active infection, and believing all the junk on the internet about Lyme. That's true for patients. It's also true for healthcare providers. I'm going to end with a couple of additional slides. There are other diseases transmitted to humans by ticks. Rocky Mountain spotted fever you will hear about. Rickets there are other rickettsia. Tularemia. Um, is transmitted to humans multiple ways. One of them is a tick bite. 
various types of ticks. There are other Ehrlichia species that you may read about. Uh, Oak clarensis, murus, murus-like, Ewingii, they are emerging and slowly increasing in prevalence. A Borrelia that's related to Lyme disease was discovered two years ago at the Mayo Clinic. It's called Borrelia mayonii, named after that, being discovered at the Mayo Clinic. And the Powassan virus and deer tick virus are all emerging tick-borne infections. Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, cases are reported in every state right now. There is a serology, and it doesn't look like the rest of the tick-borne diseases. Causes the doctors don't typically confuse it because it looks different clinically. For example, a rash on the palms. Nonetheless, it's important to have on our radar, and it's important to have reliable blood tests for this since it's potentially a fatal disease. Tularemia. Several insect vectors are handling dead animals, like um, rabbits in your backyard or squirrels or whatever. There are cases every year of people who get tularemia that way. The, the island next to Nantucket called Martha's Vineyard, where many presidents, Obama famously, vacationed in the summer, and he just bought a home there last summer, summer home. Um, on Martha's Vineyard, there have been cases of tularemia almost every year since I've been in practice. And we won't have to spend too much time about how you test for that. Um, this is the tularemia map, and you can see the dots on the far right near Massachusetts. Those dots represent Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. The Wasson virus, be the, um, I think the last one, um, does not look like um, the other tick-borne diseases. Powassan virus looks like encephalitis. So it clinically, it looks like West Nile virus or Tripoli or St. Louis virus. People are comatose. They have encephalitis. So they don't look the same clinically to doctors. Um, patients um, either die, and when they recover, they have huge neurologic deficits, and it needs a spinal tap. Why is it on this page? Guess what? It's transmitted by the deer tick. So this is an example of a virus that causes encephalitis that's present in two or three percent of the deer ticks in New England right now and is starting to be emerging. Here are the states from one year from where the cases have been. So it's out there and this is a letter all doctors got in 2017. I got it myself because I have a license in the state of New York as well. And there's other viruses transmitted by ticks. We don't have to talk about them right now. That's where Heartland virus is. So I'm not going to go over the appendix. I'm going to stop here. The appendix will be uploaded on YouTube. And it talks about, um, it shows you some references, and it gives you further support for why PCR is the methodology of choice in acute infections and as time passes, serology is more and more important. So that concludes my prepared remarks. I'm very happy to have participated in this. I hope you learned something. I hope when your colleagues ask you um, what test to order, or you just for your own general knowledge, why does a doctor order PCR in some circumstances and serology is in another? And why do you see things packaged in groups? It's because of co-infections. I hope you've been a little bit enlightened by all this. So I'm going to turn this back over to you, Tiffany. All right. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Malloy, for that very informative presentation. And I want to also thank those um, that have logged in to listen to this. For more information, you can visit our website at molecular.diasorin.com. And as Dr. Malloy had mentioned, this will be available on our website as well as our YouTube channel. Um, thanks again. I really appreciate your time and enjoy the rest of your day.